Welcome, I'm Dr. Robert Gladder, Medical Advisor for Medscape Emergency Medicine. Joining me today is Dr. Brian Miller, a hospitalist with Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and a health policy expert to discuss the current and renewed interest in physician-owned hospitals. Welcome, Dr. Miller. It's a pleasure to have you join me today. Thank you for having me. I want to start off by having you describe the history associated with the moratorium on new physician-owned hospitals in 2010 that's related ultimately to the Affordable Care Act, um, but also the current and renewed media interest in physician-owned hospitals that's linked to recent congressional hearings last month. Thank you. And I should note uh, that my views are my own and don't represent those of Hopkins or the American Enterprise Institute, where I'm an non-resident fellow, or the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, of which I'm a commissioner. Uh, so the story about physician-owned hospitals is an interesting one. Hospitals turned into health systems in the 80s and the 90s, and physicians started to shift purely from an independent model into a more organized group practice or employed model. Physicians realized that they wanted an alternative operating arrangement. You want a choice of how you practice and what your employment is. And as community hospitals start to buy physicians and also establish uh, their own physician groups, Denovo, physicians opened physician-owned hospitals. Physician-owned hospitals sort of fell into a couple buckets. One is what we call uh, community hospitals or what the you know antitrust lawyers would call general acute care hospitals. So, Hospitals mm -hmm. offering emergency room services, labor and delivery, primary care, general surgery, sort of the whole regular gamut, except that some of the owners were physicians. And then the other half of the marketplace ended up being specialty hospitals. So hospitals built around a specific medical specialty and series of procedures and chronic care. So for example, cardiac hospitals often do like cabbage, tavers, uh, maybe AAA repairs. Uh, they have cardiology clinics. They have cath labs, they have a cardiac ICU, ER, et cetera. There were also orthopedic surgical specialty hospitals, which were sort of like an ASC plus several beds. Then there were general surgical specialty hospitals. At one point, there were some women's health-focused uh, specialty hospitals. The hospital industry, of course, as you can understand, didn't exactly like this. Uh, they had a series of concerns about what we would historically call cherry picking or lemon dropping of patients. They were worried that physician-owned facilities didn't want to serve public payer patients. And there was a whole series of reports and investigations around the time the Affordable Care Act passed. Uh, you know, the hospital industry had a lot of concerns about physician-owned specialty hospitals. And there was a moratorium as part of the 2003 Medicare Modernization Act. And so as part of the bargaining over the support, hospital industry support for the Affordable Care Act, they traded their support for, amongst other things, their number one priority, which is a statutory prohibition on new or expanded physician-owned hospitals from participating in Medicare. And that included both physician-owned community hospitals and physician-owned specialty hospitals. I guess the main interest is that when physicians have an ownership or a stake in the hospital, um, this is what the Stark laws obviously were aimed at. That was part of the impetus to prevent physicians from referring patients where they had an ownership stake. And so certainly hospitals can be owned by attorneys, they can be owned by nonprofit organizations. Um, how, you know, certainly ambulatory surgical centers can be owned by physicians. But there is this, you know, ongoing issue in terms of physicians not being able to have an ownership stake. So in terms of equity ownership, we know that certain other models allow this, but basically it sounds like this is an issue with Medicare. And so that seems to be the crux of it, correct? Yes, and I would also add that it's interesting when we look at other professions. So when we look at you know, lawyers, uh, non-lawyers are actually not allowed to own an equity stake in a law practice. So in most, in many other professions, you either have corporate ownership or professional ownership, or the alternative is you have only professional ownership. I would say the hospital industry is one of the few areas where professional ownership is not only not allowed, it is statutorily prohibited functionally through the Medicare program. 
Now, there was a recent study um, that was looking at 2019 data, looking at 20, the most expensive DRGs, that was done by uh, two PhDs, looked at the cost savings. And we're talking over a billion dollars in expenditures when you, um, you know, look at the data um, from general acute care hospitals versus physician-owned hospitals. Um, and this is what appears to me to be a key driver of the push to loosen restrictions on physician-owned hospitals. Isn't that correct? I would say that's one of many components. There's more history to this issue. So, you know, I remember sitting at a think tank uh, talking to someone several years ago about hospital consolidation as an issue, right? And we went through the, the usual levers that us, you know, policy wonks go through. We talked about antitrust enforcement. We talked about certificate of need, right? We talked about rising hospital costs from consolidation, lower quality, or at least no quality gains, uh, as shown out by a New England Journal of Medicine study, uh, decrements in patient experience that mm -hmm. result from, you know, the diseconomies of scale. And, you know, they, they sort of poo-pooed a lot of the policy ideas. They basically said that there was no hope uh, for hospital consolidation as an issue. Well, what about physician ownership? Right. And so I started with my research team to sort of comb through the literature and found a, a variety of studies, uh, some of which were sort of entertaining because they do things like they'd study uh, physician owned, specialty hospitals, nonprofit owned, specialty hospitals, for profit, specialty hospitals, compare them to, you know, nonprofit or for profit community hospitals and then say physician owned hospitals that were mm -hmm. specialty were bad. And I was like, well, you just mixed ownership and service markets right there, so many ways, not sure where to start, right? And so my team did a systematic review of round numbers, 30 years of research, looking at sort of the evidence base in this space. And, you know, we found a, a couple things. One is we found that physician-owned community hospitals uh, did not have a cost or quality difference, meaning the, there was no definitive evidence that the physician-owned community hospitals were cheaper based upon historical evidence, some of which was very old. That means there's not a specific harm from them. And when you permit market entry for community hospitals, that promotes competition, which results in lower prices and higher quality. Then we also looked at the specialty hospital markets, right? Surgical specialty hospitals, orthopedic specialty, surgical specialty hospitals, and cardiac hospitals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we noted in there, and for cardiac hospitals, there wasn't clear evidence about cost savings, but there was def definitive evidence of higher quality from things like 30-day mortality, you know, for significant procedures, right? Like treatment of QMI, AAA repair, stuff like that. And then for orthopedic surgical, especially hospitals, um, we noted lower costs, higher quality, which again, sort of fits with operationally what we would know, right? Like if you are have a facility that's doing, you know, 20 total hips a day, you're creating a focus factory. Just like if you think about for interventional cardiology, your boards actually have a minimum number of procedures that you have to do to stay certified because we know about the, you know, volume quality relationship. Then we looked at uh, general surgical, especially hospitals. There wasn't enough evidence to make a conclusive thought about cost. And there was a clear trend towards higher quality. So I would say this recent study is important, but that there's a whole bunch of other literature out there too. All right. Certainly um, your colleague um, Wang from, um, from Johns Hopkins has done important uh, research in this sector. Um, your paper recently published uh, with several colleagues that came out um, uh, that does, you know, uh, mention and certainly highlight the issues that you just described, um, reconsidering the ban on physician-owned hospitals to combat, combat consolidation that's going to be published in the NYU Journal of Legislation that I understand um, forthcoming. Maybe it has been published already. Um, but one thing I want to bring up, and this is an important issue, is that risk for patients has been talked about by the AHA uh, American Hospital Association and the Federation of American Hospitals in terms of limited or no emergency services at such physician-owned hospitals in terms of having to call 911 when patients need emergent care or stabilization in that sense. 
And that's been, you know, sort of the rebuttal um, along with an OIG report from 08, almost, I guess, three quarters of the patients um, um, that needed emergent care got this at publicly funded hospitals. I'm familiar with the, the argument about emergency care. And if you actually go and look at, it differs by specialty market, right? So like physician-owned community hospitals have emergency rooms because that's how they get their business. Right, like if you are running a hospital medicine floor, general surgical specialty floor, you have labor delivery unit, you have a primary care clinic, cardiology clinic. When you have all the things that all the other hospitals have, the physician-owned community hospitals almost uniformly have an emergency room. When you look at the physician-owned specialty hospitals, it's a little more granular, right? So you look at the cardiac hospitals, they have emergency rooms. They also have cardiac ICUs, operating rooms, et cetera. The area where the hospital industry had concerns, which, you know, I, I think is valid to point out is they said that if you look at it, it's the physician owned orthopedic surgical specialty hospitals, which mm -hmm. makes sense because what that hospital functionally is, it's, it's a factory for whatever the scope of procedures, be it, you know, joint replacements, be it shoulder arthroscopy, whatever it is that the orthopedic surgical specialty hospital is like an ASC plus several hospital beds. And right. many of those did not have emergency rooms because clinically it didn't make sense. What's interesting though, is, is that the hospital industry also operates specialty hospitals, right? If you mm -hmm. go into many of the large systems, they have cardiac specialty hospitals, they have cancer specialty hospitals. And I would say some of them have emergency rooms as they appropriately should. And some of those specialty hospitals do not. Right. Mm -hmm. They might have a, a, a community hospital down the street that's part of that health system that has an emergency room, but some of those specialty hospitals don't necessarily have a dedicated emergency room. So I agree that's a valid concern. I would say, though, the question is, is what are the scope of services in that hospital? Mm -hmm. Is an emergency room required? Right. And community hospitals should have emergency rooms. Right. It makes sense also for a cardiac hospital, too. If you're running a total joint replacement factory, it might not make clinical sense. Right, but the and, patients who are treated at that hospital, if they do have emergent conditions, need to have board certified emergency physicians, in my view, because I'm an ER physician, staff that. And having, you know, um, you know, surgeons that are not, again, emergency physicians staff a department um, at a specialty orthopedic hospital or say at a cancer hospital may not be adequate from my standpoint. And that's my bias coming from well, medicine. So. I would say the anesthesiologists are actually highly qualified in critical care. So if the question is, is about clinical decompensation and you're doing a procedure, you have an anesthesiologist right there who is capable of critical care. The function mm -hmm. of the emergency room is to either serve as a window into the hospital for patient volume or to serve as a referral for, you know, emergent complaints. I, I, I would, the I, ideologist, I'll take issue, does not have the training of an emergency physician in terms of scope of practice. My anesthesiology colleagues would probably disagree for managing an emergency okay. during an operating room case. Fair enough, but I, I think in the general sense. The other issue is that, you know, in terms of um, emergent responses to patients that decompensate, when you have to transfer a patient, that violates Medicare requirements. So how is that even a valid you know, issue or argument if you're gonna have to transfer a patient from your specialty hospital? And that happens. I mean, again, I, I know that you're saying that these hospitals are completely you know, independent and can function and stabilize and treat emergencies, but that's not the reality across the country, in my opinion. Well, one, I don't think that's the case for the physician-owned, especially cardiac hospitals, for starters. Many of those have intensive care units in addition to operating rooms as a matter of routine, in addition to emergency rooms. Uh, I don't think that's the case for physician-owned hospitals, which community hospitals, which have emergency mm -hmm. rooms, intensive care units, medicine floors, surgical floors. So physician-owned community hospitals are round numbers half the market. Of that remaining market, a significant percentage are cardiac hospitals. If you're taking an issue with orthopedic surgical specialty hospitals, right, that's a clinical operational question that can and should be answered. I'd also posit that, you know, the nonprofit and for-profit hospital industries also operate 
specialty hospitals. Any of these questions, we shouldn't just be asking about physician-owned facilities. We should be asking about them across ownership types because we're talking about scope of service and quality and safety. Right. The ownership in that case doesn't matter. The broader question is, are orthopedic, surgical, specialty hospitals owned by physicians, tax-exempt hospitals, tax-paying hospitals? Is that a valid clinical business model, and is it safe, and does it meet Medicare conditions of participation? I would say that's what that question is, because other ownership models do operate those facilities. I think that you make some valid points, and I, I, I do agree on some of them, but I think that ultimately, um, you know, these models of care, certainly cost is an issue, quality is an issue, but again, it goes back to being able, in my opinion, to provide emergent care, which seems, again, to me, a very important issue. I agree that providing emergent care is an issue. It's an issue in sort of any side of care. The hospital industry posits that all hospital outpatient departments or HOPDs have emergent care. I can tell you, you know, having worked in HOPDs, I'm mm -hmm. trained in them during residency. The response, if something emergent happens, is to either call 911 or wheel the patient down to the emergency room uh, in a wheelchair or a stretcher. So I think that these hospital claims about emergency care coverage, uh, again, these are important questions, but we should be asking them across all clinical settings mm -hmm. and say, what is the appropriate scope of care provided? What is the appropriate level of acuity and ability to provide emergent or critical care? That's an important question, regardless of ownership model, I think across the entire industry. Right, and I think we need to really focus on that. I'll agree with you on that. Um, there was a March 2023 report from Dobson and Devanso. It looked at and showed really that uh, physician-owned hospitals had lower Medicaid, dual eligible, and uncom uncompensated uh, care and charity care discharges um, compared to full service acute care hospitals and that uh, physician-owned hospitals had less than half the proportion of Medicaid discharges compared to non-physician-owned hospitals. Um, they were also less likely to care for dual eligible patients overall compared to non-physician-owned hospitals. And in addition, when COVID hit, the physician-owned hospitals overall, and again, there may be exceptions, um, they were not equipped to handle these patient surges um, in the acute setting of a public health emergency. There was a hospital in Texas that did pivot, you know, that I'm aware of, Renaissance Hospital that ramped up a long-term care facility to become a COVID hospital. And I think that's the exception. What I just mentioned, I think this report does have, you know, some valid concerns and I'll let you rebut that. So uh, a couple things. One, I'm not aware that there's any clear market evidence or a systematic study that shows that physician-owned hospitals had trouble responding to COVID. I don't think that that assertion has been proven. Uh, the study was funded by the hospital industry. First of all, uh, it was not a peer-reviewed study. It was funded by an industry that paid a consulting firm. Doesn't yeah. mean that we still shouldn't read it, but that brings an air of question. Because, uh, yeah. you know, the, the joke in Washington is uh, pick your favorite statistician or economist uh, <laughs> and they can right. say what you want, right? And have a battle of economists and statisticians. For example, in that study, they didn't actually include the entire ownership uh, universe of physician-owned hospitals. If we go to the peer-reviewed literature, there's a great 2015 uh, BMJ paper that actually shows that the um, Medicaid payer mix is actually the same between physician-owned hospitals versus not. The mix of patients by ethnicity, for example, think about African-American patients, was the same. So I would be more inclined to believe the peer-reviewed literature in the BMJ as opposed to an industry-funded study that was not peer-reviewed and not independent and has you. methodological questions. But that data is eight years old, and so I'd like to see more recent data. It would be interesting just as a follow-up to that to really see where the needles moved, if it has for that matter, in terms of Medicaid uh, patients that you're referring to. I tend to be skeptical of all industry research, right. regardless <laughs> of who published it because they have an economic incentive, right? And if so they're selecting certain age groups, if they're excluding certain hospitals, that makes you wonder about the validity of the study, right? right. Because your job as an industry-funded researcher is to essentially say, you're being paid to look for an answer. It's not necessarily an honest 
evaluation of the data. I do want to actually bring up another point about the hospital readmission reduction program, HRRP, mm -hmm. and the data how physician-owned hospitals compared to uh, acute care hospitals um, uh, that are non-physician-owned, and have you comment on that? Because the Devanza st um, study did, you know, call into question again um, that you know physician-owned hospitals treat fewer patients who are duly eligible, which we we you know. Um, uh, well, I don't but, think we do know that. Well, I mean, their sure. data did point to that. Um, again, looking at the study, so um, but. Right, but I'm that's, saying that's a single study funded by the industry as opposed to an independent academic peer-reviewed literature paper, right? So, you know, that would be like saying that, you know, during the debate of the IRA that, you know, you should read the pharmaceutical industry's research, but that would be taking a, any of that at pure face value as factual. Yes, okay. we should read it. Yes, we should evaluate it on its own merits. Um, but I think, again, appropriately, you need to be concerned when people have an economic incentive. So the question about the hospital readmissions reduction program, I actually got to take a little broader because I think okay. that that program is actually unfair to the industry writ large, right? Like there are lots of factors uh, that drive hospital readmission, right? Whether Mrs. Smith went home and ate potato chips, right, and took her Lasix, right? right? That's very much outside of the hospital industry's control. So, and there's actually some evidence that the hospital readmissions reduction program increases mortality in some patient populations. So I, I think in terms of a quality metric, uh, it's unfair to the industry writ large. And I think we use what is an operating process internal metric for the hospital industry and turned it into a quality metric and attached it to a financial bonus, which is an inappropriate policy decision. I will you know, agree with you on that. One thing I do want to bring up is that whether, um, you know, the physician on hospitals are um, really uh, subject to many of the quality measures that full service acute care hospitals are. And that really is really, I think, a broader context. And 55 percent of physician owned hospitals are full service community hospitals. So I would say at least half the market is 100 percent subject to that. And if only 50 percent are, that's already an issue. Cardiac specialty hospitals which, as I said, nonprofit and for-profit hospital chains also operate, mm -hmm. are also subject to the appropriate quality measures, readmissions, et cetera. Just because we don't necessarily have the best quality measurement in the system in the country, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't allow care specialization. And as I point out, um, if we're concerned about specialty hospitals, the concern shouldn't just be about physician-owned specialty hospitals. It should be about specialty hospitals writ large. Lots of health systems run cardiac specialty hospitals, cancer specialty hospitals, orthopedic sure. specialty hospitals. And so if we're going to have a discussion about concerns there, it should be about the entire industry of specialty hospitals. I think specialty hospitals serve an important role in society, allowing for specialization and exploiting in a positive way the volume quality relationship. You know, whether those are owned by a for-profit publicly trade company, a tax exempt facility, or physicians, I think that that is an important way to have innovation and in care delivery. Because frankly, we haven't had much innovation and in care delivery. A lot of what we do in terms of how we practice clinically hasn't really changed in the 50 years since my late father graduated from medical school, right? Mm -hmm. We still have rounds. We're still taking notes. We're still operating in the same way. A lot of processes are manual. We don't have the mass production and mass customization of care that we need, right? When you have a focus factory, it allows you to design care in a way that drives up quality, not just for the average patient, but also the patients at the tail ends because you have time to focus on that specific service line and that specific patient population. And physician-owned community hospitals offer an important opportunity for a different employment model, right? Like I remember going to the dermatologist and the dermatologist was depressed, shuffling around the room, sad. And I asked him why. And he said he didn't really like his employer. And I said, why don't you pick another one? He's like, there are only two large health systems I can work for. They all have the same clinical practice environment and functionally the same value. So physicians are increasingly burned out. They face monopsony power in who purchases their labor, right? right. They have little control. They don't want to go through five committees and seven administrators and attend 25 meetings just to change 
a single small process in clinical operations. If you're an owner operator, you have a much better ability to do it. And frankly, when a lot of facilities do well now, when they do well clinically and do well financially, who benefits? The hospital administration, the hospital executives. The doctors aren't benefiting, the nurses aren't benefiting, the CNA is not benefiting, the unit secretary is not benefiting, the custodian's not benefiting, right? Shouldn't the workers have a right to own and operate the business and do well when the business does well serving the community? That puts me in the weird space of agreeing with both conservatives and progressives. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think an ownership stake is always attractive. It helps with retention um, of employed persons. There's no question that when they have a stake, when they have skin in the game, they feel more empowered. I, I will not you know, argue with you about that. We don't have business models where workers have that option in healthcare. Like the, the National Academy of Medicine said one of the key drivers of burnout is the externalization of the locus of control over clinical practice. And the current business operating models guarantee an externalization of the locus of control over clinical practice. <laughs> and if you actually look at the recent AMA meeting, there was a resolution to ban the corporate practice of medicine. So they wanted to go more towards the for legal professions model where only physicians can own and operate care delivery. Well, I think the shift is is certainly something that, you know, the AMA would like and physicians collectively would agree with, you know, having a better lifestyle, being able to have control. These are factors in burnout. And it's not just doctors. So, you know, I think nurses want a better life cycle. Like the nurses are treated as interchangeable lines on a spreadsheet, right? Like the nurses are an integral part of our clinical team. Why don't we work together as a clinical unit to build a better delivery system? And what better way to do that than to have clinicians in charge of it, right? My favorite bakery that's about 30 minutes away is owned by a baker. It is not owned by a large tax-exempt corporation. It's owned by an owner-operator who takes pride in their work. And I think that that is something that the profession would do well to return to. Because when I was a resident, you know, one of my colleagues was already planning their retirement. That's how depressed they were. And I went into medicine to actually care for patients. I think that we can make the world a better place for our patients. And what that means is not just actually treating them with drugs and devices, but it also means creating a delivery system where they don't have to wander from lobby to lobby to lobby, you know, in a 200,000 square foot facility, waiting in line for hours on end, getting bills six months later, filling out endless paper forms over and over again. Like all of these basic processes in healthcare delivery that are broken, could have and should have been fixed and have been fixed in almost every other industry, right? I have to replace one of my car tires because I had a flat tire. And, you know, the local tire shop even has an app and it sends me like SMS text messages telling me when my appointment is, when my car is ready. We have solved all of these problems in many other businesses. We have not solved them in healthcare delivery because one, we have massive monopolies that are raising prices have lower quality, I have a crappy patient experience, and we have also subjugated the clinical worker into a corporate automaton, right? We are functionally drones, and you know we don't have the agency and the authority to improve clinical operations anymore, and it's really depressing, and we should have that option again, right? Like, I trust my doctor. I trust the nurses that I work with, and I would like them to help make clinical decisions in a financially responsible and a sensible operational manner. And we need to empower our workforce in order to do that so we can recapture the value of what it means to be a clinician again. And the current model of corporate employment, massive scale, more administrators, more processes, more emails, more meetings, more PowerPoint decks, more federal subsidies. The hospital industry has choices. It can improve clinical operations. It can show up in Washington and lobby for increased subsidies. It can invest in the market and not pay taxes for the tax exempt facilities. And obviously, you know, that makes the logical choices as an economic actor to show up, lobby for increased subsidies, and then also invest in the stock market. Improving clinical operations is hard. It hasn't happened. The Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that the private community hospital industry 
has had flat labor productivity growth on average for the last 25 years, and some years it even declined. This is totally atypical across the economy. We have failed our clinicians, and most importantly, we have failed our patients. Right? I've been sick, my relatives have been sick, waiting hours, not able to get appointments, redoing forms. It's just, it's a total disaster. And like, it's time and reasonable to try an alternative ownership and operating model. There are obviously problems, the problems can and should be addressed, but it doesn't mean that we should have a statutory prohibition on professionals owning and operating their own business. There was a report that $500 million was, was saved by limiting or banning or putting a moratorium on physician on hospitals by the congressional budget Yes, the con office. I'm very aware of that data. I'd say that the Congressional Budget Office also was off by 50% on the estimation of the uh, implementation of the Part D program. They underestimated the ACA market enrollment by over 10 million people. So again, around 50% or so. They also estimated that the CMS Innovation Center initially would be a savings. Now they've re-estimated it as a 10-year expenditure and has actually cost the taxpayers money. So, you know, the CBO is not transparent about what its assumptions are, or its analysis and methods. So like mm -hmm. I, you know, as a researcher, we have to publish our information that has to go through peer review. I want to know what goes into that $500 million figure, what the assumptions are and what the model is. So it's hard to comment without knowing how they came up with it. I think you, the points you make are very valid. Physicians, you know, want a better lifestyle. Nur <clears throat> nurses want a better lifestyle. It's not even a better lifestyle. It's about having a say in how clinical operations work and helping make them better. We want the delivery system to work better. This is an opportunity for us to do so. Right, but that translates into technology, obviously AI, generative AI coming on into mm -hmm. the forefront as we know, and changing you know, care delivery models as you're referring to, which is gonna happen. It's gonna be a slow process, but I think that the evolution is happening and will happen as you, you know, accurately describe. The other thing that's different now versus 20 years ago, his managed care is here, there, and everywhere, as Dr. Seuss would say, right? So you have utilization review and prior authorization, which you know I've experienced as a patient and a physician, and boy, is it not a fun process, right? Like there's a lot of friction that needs to be improved. So if we are worried about induced demand or inappropriate utilization, by Lord, we have managed care right there to help police bad behavior. If you were to come up with, say, three bullet points of how we can work our way out of this current um, morass of where our health care systems exist, where do you see the solutions or how can we make an effect change? So I, I'd say there are a couple of things. One is uh, let business models compete fairly on an equal playing field, right? So to let the physician-owned hospital compete with the tax-exempt hospital and the nonprofit hospital. Put them on an equal playing field, right? Like we have things like 340B, which favors tax exempt hospitals, for profit or tax paying hospitals are not able to participate in that. That doesn't make any sense just from a pu public policy perspective, right? Tax paying hospitals and physician owned hospitals pay taxes on investments, but tax exempt hospitals don't. So I think in public policy, we need to equalize the playing field between business models let the best business model win. <laughs> I think the other thing we need to do is we need to encourage the adoption of technology, right? The physician will eventually be an arbiter of tech-driven or AI-driven tools. In fact, at some point, the standard of care might be to use those tools. Not using those tools would be seen as negligence, right? If you right. think about placing a, you know, a juggler or central venous catheter, to not use ultrasound would be considered insane. Right. 30 years ago, to use ultrasound would be considered novel. And so I think technology and AI will get us to that point of helping make care more efficient, more customized. So I would say those are at least the two biggest interventions that I would say. And then the third one is every time we have a conversation in public policy, we need to remember what it is to be a patient. And so the decision should be driven not around <laughs> any one industry's profitability, but what it is to be a patient and how we can make that experience less burdensome, less expensive, 
or in plain English, suck less. Safety net hospitals and critical access hospitals, you know, are part of this discussion that yes, absolutely we want, right. We want everything to be in an ideal world, function more efficiently, effectively, with less cost, less red tape. But the safety net of our nation, you know, is struggling. Hundred percent agree. I mean the. The Cook County hospitals of the world are deserving of our support and, frankly, our gratitude, right? Facilities like that have huge burdens of patients with Medicaid. We also still have millions of uninsured patients. The neighborhoods that they serve are also poor. So, you know, I think facilities like that are deserving of public support. I also think we need to clearly define what those hospitals are. So one of the challenges I've realized as I waded into this space is that market definitions of what a service market is for a hospital, like its specialty type, or how we define what a safety net hospital is, we need to more clearly define that because those facilities 100% are deserving of our support. We just need to be clear about what they are. Critical access hospitals, when you practice in a rural area, you have to think differently about care delivery. I'd say a lot of the rural systems are highly creative in how they structure clinical operations. Before the public health emergency, um, during the COVID pandemic, and we had a massive change in telehealth, rural hospitals were using within the very narrow confines as much telehealth as they should, they could and should. Rural hospitals also made greater use of nurse practitioners and physician assistants, right? A lot of the specialty services I remember, your first call was an NP or a PA because the physician was downstairs doing procedures and they'd come up and you know assess the patient before the procedure but most of your consult questions were answered by the NP or PA. I'm not saying that's the model we should use nationwide, but that rural systems are highly innovative and creative, and they're deserving of our time, attention, and support. And frankly, we can learn from them. I want to thank you for your time and your expertise in this area. We'll see how the congressional hearings affect the industry as a whole and how the needle moves and whether the ban or moratorium on physician-owned hospitals continues to exist um, going forward. Yeah, and I appreciate you having me. I mean, the hospital industry is one of the most important industries uh, for healthcare. I think this is a time of inflection, right? We need to go back to the value of what it means to be a clinician and serve patients. And hospitals need to sort of reorient themselves around that core concern. How do we help support clinicians, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, whomever it is, in serving right. patients? Hospitals have become too corporate. And so I think that this is sort of an expected pushback. Again, I want to thank, thank you for your time. Very uh, important discussion. Thank you for your expertise.